with money comes the need for more eyeballs to be on their site. And they have to think about how long they can keep eyeballs on their site. If you're gonna turn off all of your creators, they're gonna go somewhere else. I don't know that I understand the the backlash. Like surely in lieu of this happening at Substack, there are going to be 20 tools out probably already that can, can function. And like I bet Beehive probably already has that baked in. I have a question off the top. Did Substack just make a huge mistake? And the reason that this is coming top of mind and why I wanted to bring it here is because Jay Akunzo posted about this recently on LinkedIn and it points to something, this ability between big companies that are creating platforms for people to post on and then the creator. And there's like this need for creators to understand the platforms that they're engaging with and what the incentives of that platform are. So we're gonna dissect this. I'm gonna read a chunk of it and maybe we can go a little bit at a time here, but I think it's so valuable for creators to, to understand the business models and incentives of these platforms. He writes this, he says, Substack could never exist purely as a rev share platform offering free tools for a percentage of subscription sales. Substack is currently pushing towards a recommendation and a distribution network that is focused on followers, which writers are saying is causing their paid subscribers to drop in favor of these more social media like benefits. Frame this another way. You can subscribe to the newsletter or to the short post outpost and they have an algorithm that will suggest similar content in order for you to grow your subscribers or your followers. So he's saying it's YouTube. $90 million was raised by Substack and that's what makes this inevitable. They were always destined to try to be YouTube for text. I wanna pause there for a second because with money comes the need for more eyeballs to be on their site and they have to think about how long they can keep eyeballs on their site. But so often, like for creators that were on Substack, they are thinking, this is a great way for me to have a paywall and people will come read my writing and they will pay for, you know, my recurring, essentially like my newsletter, my, my blogs, my writing. So I think the shift, while he says it's inevitable, I don't, I mean, I never realized that this was their business model. Now, granted, I'm not on Substack actively, but I know plenty of people, especially in politics, that are writing on Substack that I'm intrigued by, interested in, have come across their content. So I guess, James, have do you fought, do you use Substack at all? And then when you look at this and imagining Substack positioning itself as YouTube for text, what are your initial thoughts before we get to kind of how creators need to maybe switch their thinking? I don't know Substack well. I don't use Substack. I don't subscribe to anybody on Substack. So if I'm understanding it right, writers were essentially using Substack, Substack as the kind of payment engine to be able to monetize their writing. Um, yes. And yep. that seems very easily replaceable. Like, I, I don't know that I understand the the backlash like surely in lieu of this happening at substack there are going to be 20 tools out probably already that can can function like i bet beehive probably already has that baked in like do do paid newsletter as part of your beehive subscription um convert kit would probably already have this baked into their newsletter product so i like i guess i can see like if, if you were using Substack in that way as like a newsletter platform, like you would use MailChimp or Beehive or, you know, one of these newsletter platforms. And then it's like, oh, they ripped the, they ripped the rug out from under you. And now it's like a social platform, but you can, you should, I would think still be able to reach like the distribution engine is still powerful. Like you're going to be able to reach net, net new eyes that you can just point to your beehive newsletter. Am I, am I misunderstanding it, Benji? Slightly, because I think the breakdown is if you were building Substack 
as your way, not for just mass eyeballs, but this is your business strategy. So you're thinking of it as your business home base as a writer. Now they're changing it. In fact, Jay has a comment that I think is worth um, going to. He, he put it this way. He said, if I earned a living making shows online and I was trying to get folks to pay for the show itself, and that had begun for me on a new platform, let's call it MeTube, then the platform decides to prioritize my follower growth. Now I need to find a way to drive some of those free followers. So like what you're saying, the big audience, the free followers into paying for the show themselves, even while they can access the content for free. So now I need to offer an extra product or several, or I have to switch my business entirely to sponsorships inside my free content, or I just bail from the platform because now you want me to basically run a Patreon, but without the control. So he's saying, no, you're just going to leave that platform because that can't be your core business. So the free, the free content for the mass eyeballs is not why people were on Substack. They were there because they needed paying customers. B2B brands are on a hamster wheel trying to create more and more awareness. They're putting so much work into creating awareness and not nearly enough work into making sure that the content they're putting out is actually good. You can pay to build awareness. Brands do that all the time. But does the content resonate? The question should be, how do we create content that builds affinity? And that's where Sweetfish comes in. We're here to help you build your market's favorite show, not just another show. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. Now, my question in follow-up to this is it, what, what makes it difficult to pivot to something like a beehive? If you have the subscribers, you would have their email addresses. To my knowledge, you could just integrate over without losing a bunch of people because it would still be branded your content. I don't know, but switching platforms is a headache. I do think the main point of like, you've got to understand, you know, what as a creator, like what is the incentive of the platform? That's the big part. So I want to get to that. And then Brent, I'd love to get your take here too. So jumping back into the second half of this post, he says 90 million was raised by Substack and it made this inevitable. They were always destined to be YouTube for text. Hence, free followers and a recommendation algorithm are their prime objective now. So they don't really care about paid subscribers. They care about time on platform, time on page, new people just reading content, recommending you write a personal finance article. They're going to recommend other personal finance articles to you. They're going to try to keep you on the platform. So what does that do? Tons of capital raised uh, means they need hyper growth and massive returns. Two, offering access to tech for free means they aren't a SaaS company, but an audience company. This is a really good learning for creators. What's the difference between a SaaS company and an audience company? And then this last point is hyper growth audience companies can monetize several ways, but the prime model is always the same. Substack is an advertising network. Okay. Brent. We just talked a bunch. <laughs> Jump in here, man. What What's your thoughts, takeaways, especially for more of like the creator side? Because there's all, all the business model we could get into, but specifically for creators, any main takeaways? I had a lot of thoughts on this. When I talk to whether it's a business, a creator, anything like that, a lot of them love when they have a little bit of success on one platform. They just focus on that one platform. And then they don't think if this platform is going to make a big shift, or this platform would disappear tomorrow, what would I do? And whether, I mean, the thing is we're in a society now where when we do kind of these marketing campaigns, whether it's fun or business or whatever, we are using other people's algorithms and other people's you know, rented land, I, I guess you can say. And there comes a point where you do have to perform a little bit for the algorithm. You have to understand how it works if you wanna be successful. So, but the thing is, is these creators, if it's good content, they can take it wherever they want and adapt it. So if your platform is gonna make things more complicated or change, you have to understand as a creator, these platforms are going to shift in some way as people's attention changes, as trends change, you know, things like that. And you have to be adaptable as a creator, but also on the platform side, if you're gonna turn off all of your creators, they're gonna go somewhere else. I'll tell you the one platform that 
is still trying to figure that out right now is Instagram. They um, Right now, YouTube pays really well to their high creators from the platform itself, from their advertising. TikTok d- does it too to a way. Instagram tried it and it was basically putting them in the black and they pulled it away and now they're starting to reintroduce it. They can't figure it out. So once you get comfortable on a platform, don't feel like you have to stay there forever. If you're truly creative and you're creating great content, whether you're a business or not, Find a platform that works for you, but also you've got to diversify so you don't get stuck like a lot of these creators can be. So my follow-up question to that, Brent, would just be strategy. So if you're a creator and you're, uh, let's say, I mean, like what what would be the owned land? Is it your website? Is it just knowing that you are growing a newsletter like email list because you'll always own that list of email subscribers? In your mind, like, what's the most valuable thing for a creator to have as owned land? Oh, I mean, if you're asking my opinion, the best is a newsletter because the thing is, is, you know, we've talked about how me and Scott have fairly large audiences on, on social media platforms, but, if those, if the CEOs decided to erase all the data and just delete the app tomorrow, I have no way of, of getting that. But in something like Beehive or like these newsletter platforms, if you have an, an email list that you have access to, these people gave you permission to show them content. So if you were to, to take it and just start emailing them on your own, they're not going to be offended. They're your audience. Now, if I were to have to build a second social media platform, I have to start all over and all of that, it would take me way more time than just someone copy and pasting an email news, you know, an email list and going somewhere else. So to me, there's immense value and highest ownership in a newsletter platform, because even YouTube, like they own all of your subscribers. Like they're the ones who are giving you permission to go to these people. So the, the highest ownership I would say is newsletter. Agreed. All right. I'm going to close this one out with Jay's last paragraph. He says, Substack is an advertising network. Use it for distribution of your writing if you want, but don't make it your business's home base. I wouldn't trust that any more than I'd trust YouTube as my business home base. If you don't pay for a platform's product, then you are part of the product. If you get the tech for free, something else has to lead to massive revenue growth that they need to pay back investors or merely justify the next round to ensure it's a down road. A rev share won't be the solution, uh, not at that valuation. This movie keeps repeating and people keep getting surprised, but it's the same script with different actors every time. As creators, you got to know the platform you're on, how you speak to the audience on that platform, and then where your actual owned land is. And I think that's perfect. Yeah. Don't try to build on rented land. With that, we're out.